how did she manage that? Because I, everybody's saying, how did the driver not notice? Well, right. You know how I she mean, managed I'm, it? Her husband didn't mansplain to her how to drive, clearly. <laughs> you saw that tweet today? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, dude how did that woman get under the truck in the first place i mean yeah obviously how did the driver not notice it i don't know if he was probably just so annoyed he was like i don't care i'm not even gonna stop i mean you could he could have hurt her yeah but i'm a because the joke always is like when i post accidents like i never know who's actually driving but i always blame it on a woman i'm like i can't believe we let women <laughs> drive but like when you see the woman pop her head out and wait <laughs> uh, no joseph the the schneider interview has been rescheduled to October 7th or something like that now. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, that, so why don't we... No, let's talk what? about the debate this morning between me and you. So listen, tonight's oh, main yeah. topic... Tonight's main topic is going to be uh, Ember Days and St. Martin's Lent because I want to do St. Martin's Lent this year. Well, like, we're, really... we, we're going to have a separate stream with Matthew for that. Oh, okay. I before St. Ma Martin's Lent, but yeah. Like that, so the the Matthew gave a great talk on fasting at the uh, conference. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> Listen, so I'm talking to Rob this morning, and he's like, I, and I texted him at like 5 a.m., like I always do. And I'm like, don't put Ember Days in the title. He's like, why? <laughs> because nobody's gonna click on it. Like, just nobody's gonna click on it. So if you put, look, every video we've had take off in the past few weeks has been like Bishop Strickland. Scott Hahn, stuff like that. I said, just look, we rope them in with a clickbait title, and then, you know, we, we keep them for the substance. That's what we hope. <laughs> you didn't like it? <laughs> as I as I try to explain, once the whole Strickland thing dies down, eventually, whatever yeah. ends up happening, then no one's going to search for that topic. So long run, Ember I, Day is probably better. I agree. So I said, we'll just chop it up. So what we'll do is we'll cut up a segment. We'll do a segment on Ember Days, but you rope everybody in with the title. We do a little bit of Anthony and Rob stuff because we do have some fun, some stuff we got to talk about tonight. Hook, line, and Schneider. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to play. I had another video I want you to play. I want you to play the, the whole digging video because I'm sure most people saw this today. Um, there was a news story that, that happened, but play, play the whole digging video. I mean, I I saw the the tweet, but I never actually watched. You got to watch the video because the video. It, it made me say something funny today. Well, that doesn't take much. <laughs> Thanks, Bernard. Now, finally, for now, a mysterious hole on a beach has caused a stir in North Dublin. A local astronomy enthusiast is hoping the crater in Port Marnock could be the aftermath of a cosmic event. It's a huge, mysterious crater that looks Listen out of this, this world. But is it? The unusual hole on Port Marnock Beach stopped local astrophysics enthusiast Dave Kennedy in his tracks yesterday. And he's certain the small but heavy rock inside it came it's from up above. the same above. guy that tells us the tell universe here, is 26 the billion years old. On this side here, so that would have been at the angle that it came down at. And uh, it is weighty. I'm not sure if it's composition, but we're definitely going to have to find out. <laughs> the striking hole soon right, caught so can turn up. So this idiot, he's an astronomer hope. enthusiast, and he sees a hole that a bunch of clowns dug the day before. And he's like, this is definitely a meteorological event. Like, and so that was my tweet today. I said, this is the same guy that will tell you dinosaurs existed 60 million years ago. <laughs> because, I, dude, that show we did with hugh owen really like it got me thinking a lot right like i've never been a young earther mm -hmm. were you not before the last couple of years no so i've always said evolution is nonsense like obviously right but i never even really considered young earth i was like it just sounds silly like there's so much evidence that the earth is millions of years old but then i go down this youtube rabbit hole about soft tissue and dinosaur bones and i'm like said, all right he sends me a video just called dino hunter i'm like <laughs> oh man what is this so it's but it's not that they found one dinosaur bone with soft tissue in it it's, no, it's like, like almost, they almost find bo yeah all the time now apparently yeah so it's like these people are the same people that are all right they all say 
there was a mass extinction event, but they try to blame it on a meteor, right? They, they go around the world and they're like, look at this crater in the ground. This must have happened. 16. This is the thing that killed the dinosaurs. But they never actually consider that the flood, the biblical flood, was the mass extinction event. Mm -hmm. Now, if the, if the flood is a mass extinction event, it wipes out all the dinosaurs, right? I mean, that would mean... The dinosaurs are more like 10 to 12,000 years old. Guys, no joke. This has been my jam for years. I can point you to some amazing resources. But it's not, it's not just that. When you really start digging into how shoddy the science is behind dating things that old, yeah. it's preposterous. It's not, it's not like real science. Like when they're telling you that the universe is 13 billion years old, like they could just say gajillion. It, it's just a number they throw out. It means nothing. And these are like, the same people. For, for instance, like the reason why radiocarbon dating is used so often is because carbon dating is known to be accurate because it, that, that, that whole science was developed using items that we know the age of, right? Like carbon dating can't be used for something more than 110,000 years old because of the half-life of carbon. 14 is really short compared to other things. So it, radiocarbon dating is great for stuff a few thousand years old. So we can take something where we have a, a historical pro, uh, provenance saying like, we know where and when this came from. Let's, you know, use radiocarbon dating to see what it comes up with, knowing what it should be. And when they match, well, then we know we've calibrated. But that, I think even radiocarbon well. dating doesn't even go 100,000 years, though. Uh, it's 50 to 100, de depending. Yeah. But so you know, the thing is, all the dating mechanisms that we have that they think can go far, you know, far longer back using other is isotopes. Well, we don't have things that we know for sure when it came from, right? Like yeah. we don't have something a hundred thousand years old that we know exactly what how what data was created. So we can't yeah. calibrate can't that actually, sort of test. Yeah, you can't even go accurately there. Now. Yeah. They mainly go from geological surveys, right? So they're trying to figure out when this thing existed. So they look at rock layers near where the thing was dug up. Yeah. That's essentially what they're doing. They're going and they're saying, oh, these rock layers are from this period in time. But if there's a global flood, their entire understanding of geology is completely thrown off. Now, when you go back and you, uh, and, and I was watching the Graham Hancock show, which obviously is silly, but... The point is he's showing like there was a global flood around 12, 15,000 years ago, but he won't say it's the, the biblical flood. No. He just says something cataclysmic happened. That every one of these civilizations have a flood narrative. And he, I mean, he has some silly ideas about it. But the point is the same people that are telling you that carbon dioxide is changing the climate, the same people that are telling you that uh, life doesn't begin at conception. The same people that are telling you that a man in a dress is a woman. These are the people I'm supposed to trust telling me this dinosaur is from 60 million and, years ago. And that's why, like, my views change so so much over COVID. Because they're telling, you know, they're they're changing their story on what the science is every, you know, every other week, depending on what their political yeah. masters are telling them to say. And it's like, well... If, if science can be abused this obviously for like a na national health emergency or what sh it's supposed to be one, then of course, every other, you know, every other science out there is obviously just as compromised. But you see when they come up with, okay, so if they have one of these sciences that they're so stubborn about, and especially when it has to do with ideology or something right. around something with evolution, if anything comes up that contradicts their narrative, they dismiss it out of hand. They don't they have even to look at it because yeah. that's the under evolution is the underpinning of everything that's come since basically. Yeah. Everything. That's their whole way that they could say all of these natural processes has, has happened over millions and millions of years. So I'm listen, and I'm still not a young earth creationist. I'm just saying I'm not, I'm, I'm more inclined to believe the biblical narrative than I am to believe these people. These people have lost all good faith. Yep. They have no good faith left. Like, I don't care to... So, you know, if they showed me something more solid than these silly ways that they're trying to figure these things out, like, I always thought it was like this... So, you know what? I'm telling you, I said it on the show with Hugh. I heard Joe Rogan say, 
talking about sharks and trees and he's like sharks predate trees by millions of years and i'm like where would you go like how would I mean, they know this first off even according to their science that's not true shark you know according to their science sharks may predate angiosperms which is like flowering trees and, and deciduous trees but evergreen trees and um like ginkgo trees and even ferns have been around um, long i spoke i spoke to gideon uh today he told me to send them a dm he said i'll oh, come on now sean you had said in the last show that the, also the cave drawings there are cave drawings with dinosaurs and humans what, side by what? side drawings what drawings what? drawings you, you're you gonna there's two r's in that say word? roof say roof roof no say it the way you normally say it <laughs> i know you don't say it like the that. rough <laughs> yeah <laughs> what are you a dog you're gonna pick on the way i say things. whatever mr draw mind. rings <laughs> draw drawing draw, <laughs> draw rings <laughs> wait a minute my wife when i say pyramid she makes fun of me because i say pure i say pyramid i don't say pyramid pyramid like I say pyramid pyramid yeah, pyramids. And she goes, everyone says, pyramid. Everyone says I say button really weird. You say but you say button. Button. No, you say button. No, I do not. I say button. Yeah, it's button. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. No, nah, that's not what you said, booby twat. <laughs> that's not what you said at all. <laughs> yeah, let's not make fun of each other speaking. Um so, oh, so these there's these cave drawings of humans and dinosaurs side by side they also have these rock carvings or something similar so these are they know these uh rocks are from like seven six seven thousand years ago and they have dinosaurs on them so how would unless people were digging up fossils and seeing them but they would not like a fossil record would not look so accurate like they have these rocks i'm gonna say have, have, you, have you seen the dry I have to be careful of that stupid word now. Have you seen like the artist renditions of dinosaurs from like 150 years ago? Like when when they first started digging up, when like paleontology yeah. was kind of brand new and they started drawing what they thought these animals looked like, it was nuts. And yet yeah. somehow these these older cave drawings, yeah, whether or accurate, not they're accurate triceratops they're drawing. Right. right? Yeah, it's pretty it's pretty wild. So that's all I'm saying. Like I'm not like I'm not dead set on young earth creation. I my point is I don't I just don't believe these people. I I don't believe any of them. I think that they have a, an agenda and an ideology. Anytime a scientist comes out and contradicts the climate narrative, they get lambasted by the whole scientific community. Yeah. Um I've been checking out some of Robertson Genesis stuff lately too. Like I watched The Principle again. Um and just showing, like, he, dude, they went nuts. Robertson Jenis got Michio Kaku, Lawrence. Um, uh, what are all those, like, famous scientists you always see on TV? Uh, well, you have, like, well. Lawrence Krauss. Uh, you have Neil deGrasse Tyson. You have Michio Neil deGrasse Kaku, Tyson. Uh, all Stephen these guys. Hawking, Carl yeah, Sagan. So, I don't know if they were involved, so, but. Not them, but Son Jenis gets these guys on this documentary. And the whole thing's basically on the Copernican principle. It's a documentary about geocentrism. And they're all he's just asking them questions and they're answering it. And they're like, and the whole documentary lines up to show that Earth is in this very special place in the universe. So when it comes out and they all find out later on, like they go nuts. They're like, I don't know how I got duped. I got <laughs> duped into this geocentrist documentary and all this stuff. It's pretty funny. These guys all got uh got lambasted. But do you know, who's who's Sam Shamoon? I don't know who that is. I think he um, might follow or follow. He us, does. Actually. He follows us. Yeah. He 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 made a post about us once. Really? Yeah. I saw like somebody posted it in our Telegram. He made a post about us, and I thought he was uh, attacking us, and it turns out he was st like sticking up for us. So I wrote a comment on it. I don't know if he's a new convert. I don't know anything about the guy. Well, yeah, I really don't. I'm really unfamiliar with him too. Adrian um, says he does videos with Lloyd De Jong. Oh, so that's the guy Kennedy has on. Yep. Okay. Um, the other thing is I'm on day five, no smoking, and I'm I'm standing strong. I figured your lack of nicotine may drive me to drink, so I just I brought some alcohol. <laughs> um, you know what it is? I think we do the only reason I mention this is I think we probably have a lot of people that smoke, whether it's a vape or cigarettes in our uh in our that watch us. And I was somebody who 
I, I smoked since I was 13. So that's 27 years of smoking. And the vape was 12 years. I never thought I could quit. This is the longest I've ever gone. Hold on, though. The same people that tell you evolution exists tells, tells you cigarettes are bad. <laughs> I've, I have, I have uh, cancer in my family, so... I know, I'm but just making a joke. Re regardless of that, just being a slave to something, um, right? Like, true freedom is freedom from vice. Yeah. And... I have, I have, I have one or two more vices that I want to get out after the smoking thing. I'm tackling this, and then I got one or two more I want to get rid of that are really like on my conscience that I want to get out. Um, but it really is amazing how when, like, God really can help you through getting some of these things out of your life. I mean, he, I, I was begging him for months to just please anything, and he, I'm not kidding. I think that whole episode at my house that night was was a mercy from god like don, whatever don, happened don's got a very good point you need to drop the rocket fuels <laughs> so and the pina coladas <laughs> and all the other fruity little drinks it but sugar is one of those vices I, yeah, I, sugar's i'm bad. gonna say like sugar is really bad and i and i have a real problem with sugar and anything in moderation is okay but anything we overdo and the the smoking thing i never thought i could quit i've tried a hundred times like no joke a hundred times i've tried and i've made it a day or two this is the first time where i just am dead set on not touching it i just don't care and a lot of it has to do with me just saying like i i'm i have to be a man about this i can't i can't i have to set an example for my kids i have to be here for my kids i have to be here for my wife so if anybody's struggling with it man you could do it <laughs> I mean, I'm saying this a little prematurely. It's only five days, but it's it's more than I ever thought I could go. So uh, I smoked cigarette 15 years and vape for eight. Now nicotine free for a year. You could, do, yeah. I, and all the people that have been a praying for me and b sending me like little messages of support and just saying stick through it, man. You'll get through it. Like they're so helpful. They really are. And I'm telling you, the things that I'm coughing up in the morning, I can't believe it. Because when you when you stop smoking, it all starts to come out of you. If you start to cough up little animals, go see an exorcist. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, we got about ten minutes before. Uh, yeah. What do we want to get to on? before? Do we want to do Oliver the... Anthony before Strickland? Do we have to do Oliver Anthony at all? Nah, that just seems to. stupid. All right. Um, Let's at least right, do Strickland two... if we have time. Then maybe. All right, we'll do Strickland. Um, you want to pull that article up? All right. Bishop, I'm sorry, Bishop Schneider. Uh, future popes will thank Bishop Strickland for his fidelity to the Catholic faith. Dear Bishop Strickland, thank you that you are resolved to serve the Lord and not the time and not the time. Bishop Schneider wrote in a newly released personal letter to Strickland. Uh, let's see. Your Excellency Bishop Strickland, dear and esteemed brother in the Episcopate, it is for me a privilege and a joy to express to you all my gratitude an appreciation for your intrepid dedication to the up uncompromising uncompromisingly to uncompromisingly keep transmit and defend the catholic faith which the apostles handed over to the church and with which all the generations of catholics especially our ancestors our fathers our mothers our priests religious sisters catechists were themselves nurtured in all truth we can apply to you dear bishop strickland what saint basil once stated in his in his time charge What's going on with my phone? You, you're going to have to read this. because my The phone... one charge which is now sure to secure severe punishment is the careful keeping of the traditions of the Father. One thing that strikes me just off, like, right away is, like, the language that, like, Schneider and, and Strickland and just the language they use is, is Catholic, right? Like, it's the same language that all the saints have yeah. used, whereas you read something from, generally from the Vatican or from... Well, you know, from from um, any other bishop in, in from any McElroy and, and and McCarrick's other nephews, like their HR. It, it sounds like corporate HR speak. New you speak. Know, whereas this sounds Catholic. Yeah. Um, um, all right, I got it now. Uh, let me share with you the following highly timely words of the same great saint. 
The doctrines of true religion are overthrown. The laws of the church are in confusion. The ambition of men who have no fear of God rushes into high posts in the church. An exalted office is now publicly known as the prize of impiety. The result is that the worse a man blasphemes, the fitter the people think him to be a bishop. Clerical dignity is a thing of the past. There is a complete lack of men shepherding the Lord's flock with knowledge. Churchmen and authority are afraid to speak for those of them who have reached power by human interest are the slaves of those to whom they owe their advancement. Faith is uncertain. Souls are drenched in ignorance because of because adulterers of the world imitate the truth. The mouths of true believers are dumb, while every blasphemous tongue wags free. Holy things are trodden underfoot. We are living indeed in such a time as described by St. Basil with such a striking similarity. The words of St. Basil in his letter to Pope St. Damasus, in which he is... He, in which he was asking the Pope's help and efficacious intervention are fully applicable, applicable to our situation today. The wisdom of this world wins the highest prizes in the church and has rejected the glory of the cross. Shepherds are banished and their places are introduced grievous wolves hurrying the flock of Christ. Houses of prayer have none to assemble in them. Desert places are full of lamenting crowds. The elders lament when they compare the present with the past. The younger are yet more to be compassionated for they do not know of what they have been deprived. I mean, oh man. It's crazy that St. Ba Basil is writing of then and not now. Like this right. could be, uh, this seems like a prophecy of now, doesn't it? The younger are yet more to be compassionated for they do not know what they have been deprived. Think about how many of us went, you took our birthright. Yeah. It, it's seeming more and more like Strickland isn't going to, um, Go Step willingly. Down. No. Yeah, he's not he's not gonna go willingly. And then you had um Diane Montagna interviewed uh Cardinal Mueller, and Mueller says, Should the Synod approve the blessing of same-sex couples or or a female diaconate? Mueller said every ecclesiastical official would have lost his authority, and no Catholic would be obliged any longer to religiously obey a heretic or schismatic bishop. It sounds uh Kind of like, like something the Zetis have been saying for some time. It sounds like, you know what it sounds like? It sounds like Lefebvre. Well, 100%. Yeah. Right? I'll tell you what. what's really good is, yeah, it sounds like Altman. What's really good is that I know a lot of people were turned off by Altman, and I know a lot of, but the thing is, the, the courage to speak is contagious, right? So when a guy like Altman says the things that he said, it inspires other men to say the things that they say. So Strickland, after his apostolic visitation went off, he just started doubling down and he hasn't said just letter after letter after letter and just but doing nothing but preaching the eternal Catholic faith. I mean, he's mm -hmm. not, he's not saying anything, but like if they're really upset that he's, just preaching Catholic doctrine. I mean, what does that say? Yeah. I mean, th and that's because he's not making any, any accusations. Like you said, he's just preaching stuff that has been in catechisms for centuries. And yet that's what they're coming down on. Yeah. Because they're going to make it as if this is about financial stuff in his diocese. And you're going to see some wacky accusations come out. I still don't think Francis as, is as someone in accounting I'm, I'm like uh if they do some sort of audit auditors can come up with literally like yeah they'll they can magically come up with anything they really of course can. it's the same thing that what is happening to trump like they'll find stuff on you it's the same thing that happened with the january 6 people if they want to get you they get you yeah if they want to get you they get you but the thing is it, it's they're going to ask him to resign, but if he refuses, they would have to depose him. That's and not so easy. They, they, yeah, they would have to do so canonically. And good luck. Because, could, I mean, Francis could move him somewhere, though. Put him in some... Like, can he put him in some foreign outpost like they did to Bunini? Or does he have to stay in America because he's not a cardinal? Bunini wasn't... Um, he wasn't an ordinary... Yeah, you know it, it, he when the, he they I, I don't know what Bunini. So a lot of um, 
all of your auxiliary bishops, as well as you know a lot of your bishops uh, in the curia, they don't actually have sees. They have what are called yeah. t- uh, titular sees, titular. Yeah. which they they used to be actual Catholic sees, but they you know throughout history they they fell away. So there's they they ha- you know a bishop must have a see, so they give them these old sees, but there's no Catholics in them. So they're not actually the ordinary of anyone. Whereas yeah. with Strickland, I don't, I don't know if you can just move a bishop. I'm not sure. Um, all right. So Matthew's here. Let's just bring him on. Let's Matthew. Anthony, Hello. how are you? What's going on? This has been a long time coming, man. We've been on um, one Peter five together. Mm-hmm. We mm-hmm. met at the conference, mm-hmm. but we've never actually got to like sit and hang and talk, man. <laughs> yeah, it's been, it's been a long time in the making. Um, do you prefer Matthew or is it Matt? Okay. Or is it not matter? Uh, either one, either one don't matter. That's okay. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's funny. Sometimes I ask people if I could say like a- a short, Anthony of prefers the situation. <laughs> <laughs> we were actually just talking about, um, Schneider, uh, wrote a letter to Strickland, just giving him some moral support for being brave right now. What, what do you, what do you make of that scenario? Well, it's good, uh, you know, I would imagine if any priests, you know, are, are going through a lot, it's good to have your brother priest supporting you. And I would imagine a bishop would want to have his brother bishops also coming out to support him. But at the same time, understanding that, you know, if nobody shows up too, like you got to stick by, you know, your conscience of doing what's right for the faith too. So yeah. I mean, our Lord did the road to Calvary virtually alone. He had a little support. But sometimes you got to go out there and the martyrs, too. Sometimes they seem to be all alone. So it's good that some people like, you know, Schneider is acting like a St. Veronica, maybe in this instance, and helping him along the way. But he's got to, you know, stick to what what he really believes the Lord's calling him to. Yeah, it's it's uh, we're, I we were just saying that sometimes when somebody comes out and says something, it inspires other people to right? the mimetic desire works both ways. So it could cause cowardice or it can cause other people to finally speak up when they were feeling something, but they see somebody else do it first, then they'll follow in their lead. And I think yeah. you're starting to see a lot of people start to speak up now. Mm-hmm. That's good. Cause a lot of people aren't natural leaders. A lot of people are followers. And sometimes you just need a few people to break into the fray and say, no, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to follow this law. I'm not going to stick with this. I'm standing up. And, and then people go, that's what, you know, Archbishop Lefebvre really did too. So yeah. he, he stood and, made a line in the sand and sometimes you need to do that for moral issues too in our society too you need to say no i will not cross that line and it takes sometimes a couple people to do that and then other people will come around you um matt when uh let me hear a little bit of your your conversion story you don't have to tell the whole thing like kind of give us a little snapshot like when did you did you grow up catholic are you a convert what's your what's your story yeah, so um, my family, we well, we were not religious at all until I was in high school. So we really, um, so I, my father was raised Catholic. He he kind of left the faith practice wise in um in the seventies. But uh, it was it was actually really nine eleven that kind of brought us back the the wow. turmoil from that and everything. Of course, we've we've never lived in New York. We have no connection there. So some people think, you know, it's only really New Yorkers are affected. But a lot of people just saw like, you know, things could happen. You could, your whole life could be taken away at any moment. And, you know, my family kind of looked how, at that How too. old were you when 9-11 happened? I was like 11 or 12. Okay. So you're, you're, you're around my age. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, okay. So your parents, your, your parent now, was your mom Catholic? No, she was never Catholic. She grew up in a, in a family that was very anti-Catholic when she was... Mm growing up um her mom actually forbid her to play with anybody in the neighborhood who was catholic you were not allowed <laughs> to play with neighbors who were catholic that was the rule if only catholics had that kind of conviction <laughs> <laughs> so no they were actually so when she actually uh told uh my grandparents that she was becoming catholic too they did not speak to her for about three years wow so you're 12 now were you already baptized and no, were you no i was not so so i was yeah i entered the church um in 2004. now did you go through catechism or did you just go to rcia at that age uh it was an rcia class that's what yeah that's what i figured because when you miss your first communion and stuff and all that they, they usually will just put you through an rcia class yes, so exactly. now did, did, are, were you taking your faith seriously or kind of just following your parents lead Oh, no, I definitely took it very seriously. It was very meaningful to me. And 
looking now, I'm I'm like a big impetus. You know, I try to be for trying to get everybody in my family who to go to mass every Sunday. Some people are like, ah, you know, we'll just skip this week. No, we can't skip a week. You know, you got to go sure. checking on people, encourage them. So I do, you know, try to do what I can to really. And same thing with my, you know, my, um, my dad's mom, who was always Catholic, uh, my grandma, I try to, you know, encourage her to go to because she's kind of like, I'm old, I don't, I don't feel like driving. And, you know, sometimes you got to do what you have to do. So no, I, I think it really was the Holy Ghost um, inspiring me because I think it had a big impact on my family too. That's cool. So all right, so you start taking your faith seriously at that young age. Now, what what leads you? Like, when's your first experience of more traditional leaning Catholicism because I know like it was actually during that RCA program I online actually I attribute a lot of what I learned to the faith not to in-person RCA which I think it was very flawed in some respect of course it had kernels of truth to it there's actually one of the reasons I got so involved in catechesis and helping out the like the catechism class.com programs I'm affiliated with and such as I see the need for strong catechetical programs like RCA and such to really fill the need that so many superficial programs out there are doing right now. Mm -hmm. And um, I know some traditionalists don't like RCA, but I think they don't like what RCA in practice is. If it's just, if you're thinking about it as a means to bring people into the faith, to properly catechize them and enter the church, of which I think of RCA, not necessarily these certain experiences you might had or I had, I, I think they can be very meaningful, especially if they are traditional. But it was during that time I, I was going online and, you know, I spent a lot of time on the fish eaters website, of which I owe yeah. a great a debt to, to teaching me like what Catholic culture really was, what it meant to be Catholic and the forums there. And I learned a lot. I learned a little about the traditional mass. And my family even had a neighbor down the road who we started talking to more that time. And uh, it turns out his dad recently died. And he's like, I, I know you guys are becoming Catholic. And um, he has these, you know, Catholic VHSs, you know, we, we don't, not going to use them anymore. You guys want them. So we I know we put one in and it was actually one of those old videos of a traditional Latin mass filmed in uh like I think in, in somewhere in England in 1997 and it's, wow. it's it's kind of popular in the track community that was one of the first ones so watching is beautiful and uh ever since you know kind of then and what I learned like that's what I wanted to do and I really had that conviction uh but it wasn't until my first year of college I was able to to go to a traditional mass so okay, this is this is so cool. Um, so now, as you're coming into tradition, because I we were at that conference, you gave such an amazing talk, oh, and I like I I'm we wanted to actually get you on for St. Michael's Lent, and mm -hmm. the scheduling didn't work out. Um, and I wanted to do St. Michael's Lent, but I I wanted to understand it first. So we're gonna wind up bringing you back on for St. Martin's Lent, but I want to do St. Martin's Lent this year. Like, when did you start learning about all these traditions that that we've completely lost? Because these are the things, like mm -hmm. even, and we really brought you on to talk about Ember Days today because I think a lot of us are afraid to fast. I mean, we had a, our Telegram today. Some people, some of the people were saying like, I'm terrible at fasting. I don't. But there's there's got to be a way to just get started and to. Some people say you're terrible things. at praying too. It doesn't mean you don't pray. It means you learn how to pray better. You put time and effort into it. You know, like yeah. I run marathons for fun. You can't be like, uh, you know, I I went out there and I tried to run it and I failed. So it must not be for me. You know, like you yeah. know the same thing. Like don't try to be like I'm going to adopt all the traditional fasting days off the bat. No, let's you know start to do uh, a few of them. Um, that's um. That really makes a big difference. So, I mean, I wrote about it in my book, The Definitive Guide to Catholic Fasting and Absence. This is the book I talked a little bit about at the conference. And I'm actually working in a second edition right now because there's so many questions I wanted to even delve deeper really into understanding. Because the first one was so much about our history as Americans, what we lost and what was really stolen from us. Not in 1962, you know, not in 1950, but consistently over the generations, how to bring it back. And the second edition is going to be uh, so many other countries had the same thing. The Hispanic world, the Philippines, the French, they all just kind of wanted to whittle away this down. So it doesn't matter really where you're at right now. You can incorporate more fasting. And one of the really um, one of the really, uh, you know, inspiring things for me when I became Catholic was Lent and, and Friday absence and people care so much they're willing to forgo certain things certain times of the year that to me was a huge draw so like i can't imagine uh wanting to be catholic if had there not been lent 
I remember how invigorating that practice was and Friday abstinence year round, of course, as I learned from fish eaters and how much I rely on that. And then over time I realized, well, and I probably been doing St. Martin's lead now for probably about six or seven years. Um, but when you understand these things, you understand like some of this was practiced for centuries under penalty of sin, not like, you know, yeah. it'd be great if you can do this, it'd be great for your spiritual life. No, like if you don't do this, you sin. You know, and we as a whole Catholic community around the world are doing this. And when that has been robbed and taken away and hidden and we don't know about it anymore, we've lost a part of our heritage, something when that you, our forefathers in heaven knew and loved. And we don't know, know about when you read the the, the popes like the, the popes before our time, it's almost like they speak about fasting as if every Catholic should just under, understand it. They don't they don't. It's almost as if when they say it, they just assume, you know, this is just what you should be doing. And part of the reason there are so few conversions now are because so few people fast, so few Catholics are fasting. My favorite liturgical time of the year is Advent now. It never was. I used to love Advent, right? And mm -hmm. I'm sorry, did I say Advent? I, my favorite mm -hmm. time is Lent. Like, mm -hmm. It used to be Advent because you love Christmas and you love all that mm -hmm. stuff. But Lent, there's something so amazing about Lent for me now because no matter where I am in my life, in my spiritual life, Lent is like that boot camp that gets me back it on is. track and it, and it sets me right. And I'm, I, I really get excited for it as it's coming up. Mm -hmm. So as we're coming up on St. Martin's Lent this year, I want to get as excited for that as I do for regular Lent. Because when you observe a fast like this, the end, the finish line is truly rewarding. There's a reason that studies done before the 60s would poll Americans what are your favorite holidays? Easter was easily always in the top three. Yeah. Easter's no longer in the top three. When you're not fasting all these days, you're not looking forward to it as such. Now, you know, you got things like Halloween in the top three. You know, before it was Christmas and Easter, usually, and then Thanksgiving, you know. But when you're preparing so much, and when you fast leading up to Christmas, too, and you have to forego these, you know, these different Christmas parties, which shouldn't be an ad in any way, and you have to do some sort of spirit of mortification during this time, it really makes you look forward to Christmas more and midnight mass all the more, you know, when you really prepare things. And there's so many intricacies the fasting world teaches us. Like even Christmas Eve was a mandatory day of fasting and absence until the 1960s. So, I mean, that's why the Italians have the Feast of Seven Fishes, because it was mm -hmm. a day of absence. That's why so many people in Eastern Europe had that as well. And there was even so much concern, like, so you're probably aware that before, uh, you know, the time of, of Pope Pius XII, the Eucharistic fast was no food and no water from midnight until mm -hmm. the time of Holy Communion. And that went back really to apostolic times. The apostles themselves really, uh, the early church instituted that. And I talk about that in the book in the whole chapter. Um, but a lot of moral theologians taught about, well, you can observe the spirit of the rule. So, you know, you're celebrating Christmas Eve. You finally have that dinner. It's a fasting day. But at what time should you stop having that dinner? Because if you go to mass at midnight, you could, you could potentially have dinner till 1159. And then you go to mass and then you would receive Holy Communion shortly after. And that defied the spirit of the fast, but not the letter of the law. So there were even documents put out that make sure your dinner ends by 8 p.m. So you fast at least four hours, not because that was the rule, but because that was the spirit. And fasting questions like this were so pertinent that theologians would talk about it, priests would talk about it, people would ask counsel about it all the time. Like my book will go over things like chocolate. Is it a liquid or a solid? And you might think that's, you know, <laughs> a flipping question, but in certain cultures, it was very serious because at yeah. room temperature, my, my chocolate is a liquid but I froze it into solid. Can I eat it or not? Can I drink it? And the similar question, what does it mean to be a liquid? Does it mean you drink it? Does it mean it has to have no calories? Does it mean it have a certain amount of calories? Those were all answered in former times, things people don't think about whatsoever now, but it shows you so much thought was put into observing the letter and the spirit, especially when you consider, so I put together a calendar for my a Catholic Life website, and it's mentioned in the book as well. There were roughly two thirds of the year, you could not eat meat. And there were roughly one third of the year was a fasting day. So that used to be required. And that doesn't include like St. Michael's Lent here. That's not other devotional yeah. things. Right. I, I know Rob wants to ask a question, so I'm going to let him ask. And then I want to, and then I want to say something real quick. 
I actually didn't have a question. <laughs> oh, I looked like you were trying to jump in. So, uh, all right. So, Aaron, our friend Aaron, is a Protestant. He's been very curious, checking out a lot of Catholic channels and stuff. So, I mean, you're talking. We there are people that watch this show that really don't even. Maybe they don't even understand the purpose of fasting. I mean, they mm -hmm. know it's in Scripture. Jesus says some things can only be uh, solved by prayer and fasting. Yeah, some what demons is, can only be driven out by prayer. Driven out by prayer and fasting. So. What is what can what can we get what can we do as people that are just starting out that really don't know much about it? What 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 can we really give people as inspiration and maybe try to make a little bit of a change in their daily life? Well, I think you got to start by, you know, history. History's on our side here. If you look at what did the early church do, they knew and practiced fasting, really in two concrete forms: devotional fasts of every week. So Wednesdays and Fridays were days of fasting and abstinence. And of some places like Rome added Saturdays as well. So those those yeah. were the days throughout the whole year you would, why would uh, fast and abstain. For those who might not know, why would those day be be devotional fast? Well, well, uh, Fridays of course because that's the day in which Christ died on the cross. Wednesday because that was the day in which he was betrayed, and then Saturday because that was the day he lay uh, lie in the tomb dead and his mother was grieving for him. So and the, all the, all all the apostles themselves grieved. So those are the days of penance throughout the year. But more than that, the apostles themselves instituted Lent. More than one church historian say Lent was instituted by the apostles. And um, they say that our Lord himself did not institute the Lenten fast because he wanted to give the church some discretion. You know, the church is the keys to bind uh, and to loose. But, you know, they instituted very early on and it was kept since these ancient times. Some other days were added, though, very early on. And if we study what, you know, you can study how fasting was practiced and you can go over a lot of things. But, you know, basically it comes down to, as St. Thomas Aquinas thought, fasting was done for a couple of things. One, to, to bridle uh, our flesh, to really increase temperance in us, to make restitution for sin as well, and then to raise your mind to contemplate heavenly things. So if you think about so many people now say they don't have time for prayer or they can't focus in prayer. I mean, if you were fasting more, you don't have time for lunch. You know, there's no lunch. You don't have breakfast. Those are extra prayer times you could have in the day. The mental clarity you develop. I mean, I even go over in the second edition of the book that I'm working on so many physical benefits that um, physicians and studies have shown uh, mental benefits for clarity as well, as well as physical benefits against ailments. So there's so much you can benefit from. So allowing yourself to understand what our forefathers did in practice has immense benefits to us. But in addition to the fast I mentioned, Ember Days, what we're going to talk about today, is very ancient as well. I mean, St. Leo the Great says he thought it was an apostolic institution himself. But we know that uh, it at least goes back to Pope Callistus, who reigned in the 220s. So it's at least that old. Now, Ember Days are, are based on a, a Jewish tradition, right? Um, yes. Yeah, so some people would say, actually, that Ember Days ultimately go back to the Old Testament. So the prophet Zacharias talked about fasting at different times throughout the year. So that would be the fourth, fifth, seventh, and tenth months of the year. It's mentioned in the Old Testament. And the church appropriated those times and really consecrated those to God in the Christian context of using those times to thank God for the fruits of the earth, and, and to and to bless the uh, you know the, what we cultivate, but also very importantly, and this really distinguishes them from rogation days, is that these days are also set aside to pray for priests and pray for those being ordained. So much so that uh, Ember Saturdays were the privileged days for priestly ordination for a long time, as even mentioned in the 1917 Code of Canon Law. Basically, you need to ordain priests on Ember Saturdays, really, unless a grave reason. Um, uh, you know, warrant something otherwise. Bishop consecrations take place on Sundays or Feasts of the Apostles, but priestly ordinations are Ember Saturdays. I never heard of Ember Days until 2017, 2018. I never even heard of them before that until I started going to the traditional Mass. Once I started going to the traditional Mass, I started hearing about them. So the, a couple of years back, um, Eric Sammons and Taylor Marshall had a conversation and it kind of changed my whole understanding of what it means to be Catholic, because our whole lives should be on this rhythm of fast, fast feast. It shouldn't yes. be it shouldn't be just at Lent that we give a chocolate up or anything. It should be throughout your entire life. You should be fasting and saving Sundays as a feast day. You should like really your whole week 
should be depriving yourself a little bit. And that was always so mm -hmm. daunting to me. But Eric actually had said, look, if you're if you're having a hard time fasting, try starting off with just not having your breakfast until a few hours later or skip breakfast. Yes. Totally. Like that. I actually find that to be fantastic advice. So I find that as soon as you start to eat, it's going to increase your metabolism. You're going to be hungry. Mm -hmm. If you can delay that. So, you know, they say now two small meals and one day, one large meal is, is a fast it's in the, in the real context of, of um, fasting, you would call the morning thing a frustulum, the evening snack, a collation and a meal in between. Um, but the thing is, you don't have to have those. If you forsake those and just wait to have your meal later, it's going to be much easier, I feel like, because it's amazing how long one can go without eating. But if you eat that little something, you're going to want more. Best to forego it. Great advice. Yeah. So th that was the first thing that helped. The other thing was people don't realize that the stomach is the root of other vices. So um, uh, M, M Proximus just actually said, so I just quit smoking, right? I've smoked for 27 mm. years. Um, so he actually said, ant fasting will help you doing that other thing. And he's right. Because I think he means the sugar thing too. Oh, the sugar thing too. But it's really even the smoking. Or if you're struggling, a lot of guys are struggling with crap on the internet. If you have a vice that you're trying to root out of your life, getting to the stomach, the stomach is the, yes. the root of every other and vice. Thomas Aquinas and other saints of that era said the best cure for sins, especially against temptations for purity, was fasting. Fasting yeah. more. That is the the remedy for that. So it is. Um, it's not just depriving yourself of chocolate. If you look at what did the early Christians do in fasting, one meal after sunset, it was a vegan meal. Um, so until the mid 1700s, by definition, if it was a fasting day, meat was not to be had. So there was no yeah. exception to that. So, but in the early church, it was even vegan. Fish wasn't allowed until about the year 600. So basically like that, that's what they did. They forego that snack, waited till the evening, had their meal. They wouldn't even have water during the day until their meal so it's really quite something when people now think a fast can be substituted with giving up chocolate or you hear people say i'm on a media fast and not going to have tv well if you have struggled with tv you should probably give it up too but that doesn't replace a fast a fast it has to be with food you're subjecting your body to that so actually yeah. i mean i've even heard from priests and seminarians that they were replacing some fasting with media fast and that's really absurd you know that you want to do that in addition as extra penance that's fine, probably meritorious, but it does not replace the physical harm one needs to do to themselves. You know, our Lord said the kingdom of heaven is won by violence and the violent yeah. bear the way. And he referred to the violence as the violence we do ourselves in penance, not the violence you inflict on others. The violence of penance is how you win heaven. Yeah, I think we're all going to be held to account for all the complaining we do about bad clergy, for all the complaining we do about the state of the church. We're every one of us are going to have to answer for the little sacrifices we were unwilling to give up. Like these things that we're unwilling to give up, we are we bear some of the responsibility of the sins that are in the church because what happens to one member mm -hmm. it affects the entire church. Mm -hmm. And you have a means, if you're in the state of grace, to offer a fasting to repair those sins. And I do feel like those people who go throughout their day without making a morning offering to offering up their day, including their fasting in restitution for sin and to prevent future sins, they are complicit. Yeah, that's a, that's a rough one to think about, guys. And so that's why I think Ember Days is such an important one, because we're all saying how much we want holy clergy. So. What is what is the traditional, um, like what is a traditional Ember Day fast? Is it just a day of abstinence, or is it a day of fasting and abstinence? What, it is fasting and abstinence. So I mean, um, actually, it was relative. So you probably heard that you know nowadays um, Ember Wednesdays and Ember Saturdays are considered partial abstinence in the nineteen sixty two calendar. Partial mm -hmm. abstinence was invented in seventeen forty one by Pope Benedict the Fourth um, uh, by. Um, what Pope Benedict the Fourteenth, yeah, and um, it was really he would just acquiesce into the um, demands of the modern world, who were like, we we need you know have meat during Lent, you know, so he gave in and allowed uh, you know certain days uh, during Lent, during weekdays, uh, of course not Fridays though, and never Saturdays either, as days where meat could be had at the main meal, but not at the frustulum snack or the collation snack, <clears throat> but that's where it came. But Ember days themselves remained as days of complete abstinence 
until January 28th of 1949. So at that day, the U.S. bishops got permission that the Wednesdays and Saturdays of Ember Days, you could have meat at your main meal. But before then, before 1949, it was really unheard of. So that's really how far back it goes. So if it's an Ember Day, it is a day of abstinence. And it's also a fast, which means you can only have one meal and you really should forego those frustulum and collation if you can. There was actually... Even at the end of the 1800s, the Baltimore Council, the plenary council in Baltimore, they even released manuals to tell people, like, if you're weighing your snack, make sure it doesn't weigh too much. You know, how many ounces should it be? Because if it's too much of this, it's it's going to be too much like a meal. Uh, the, the thought of that is rather uh, is completely foreign to Catholics now that, you know, your snack should even be weighed to make sure that you're not violating the fast in the letter yeah. or in the spirit. So. You come so far. So Ember Day should be days of fasting. They should be days of absence. They should be days of increased prayer, though, especially offering that up for blessing of the fruits of the earth, as well as offering it up for clergy. You know, especially those maybe a lot of dioceses now no longer ordain on Ember Saturdays, but we can at least offer it up for priests who are recently ordained or soon to be ordained. It priests, you know, anybody in that season. Um, yeah. So, so, so there's certainly a lot of merit uh, to be had for that. But, but there's also some other things, you know, that I think is doing it just, you know, having the right mindset. And uh, part of that comes down to, and I read this online, that we can have different focuses of thanking God for certain particular fruits of the earth at each season. So, for instance, this one website said these upcoming Ember Days. So these are the autumnal Ember Days, also called the Michael Mass Ember Days. Um, they occur after the Feast of the Exaltation Holy Cross. And this would be the ideal Ember Days to give thanks to God for grapes that are used to make the precious blood of Christ. So that's something we might want to be in particular thankful for. And it relates really well because we just celebrated the Feast of the Nativity of the Blessed Virgin Mary on September 8th, the traditional day to bless grapes and the grape harvest. So there's a reason like when we're we don't even do these things anymore. This is so crazy. Yeah. Yeah, but the uh, same thing like the, the winter ember days, the traditional days to give thanks to God for olive oil that he will use to make the holy oils for unction. Or in spring, giving thanks to God for the flowers and the bees that are used to make the blessed candles that will be used for baptisms mm -hmm. in an upcoming Easter. And summer, to thank God for, for wheat that he uses and allows to be turned into the Eucharistic host, which becomes our Lord himself. So it has a different mindset when you try to, you know, be conscious of this, I think. Uh, what state do you live in? I live in Chicago. Oh, Chicago. Oh, so it was easy for you to get to that conference. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> All right. So now for St. Martin's Lent, that starts on uh, on November 11th, right? Um, ye, uh, well, November well, 11th is Martin Mass. Martin so uh, St. Martin's Lent would start November 12th, the feast of the day um, after. Yeah. Oh, so we would have his feast day, and then the following day begins the Lent. Yes, Martin Mass is really the, the Catholic Thanksgiving. I wrote an article on this before. Uh, I, I write for the Fatima Center for Catholic Family News, 1 Peter 5. I think I've addressed it maybe in all over the years. But Martin Mass is a very important day. It's the Catholic Thanksgiving. So, I mean, if it's not a Friday or a Saturday, um, one would have goose. That's traditional mm -hmm. food to have. You would actually walk around with your children with lanterns at night and these lanterns were to symbolize your charity like the charity of saint martin who took off his cloak and cut it in half and gave it to a beggar and that was actually christ in disguise so that's to symbolize that so in catholic cultures there were parades there was great celebration this was to be great charity uh, of this and it would be a day of merriment before the fast and unfortunately um uh, you know, that's obviously when World War One ended, November 11th, so Armistice Day. And some people speculate that, um, you know, Woodrow Wilson made that a holiday and all, and he put a lot into into that holiday. And people speculate, uh, because he was a Freemason, he was very anti-Catholic as a Protestant, that he kind of wanted to obscure the last remnants of Martin Mass in America because these Catholics were out there celebrating, and he did not want to have any Catholic celebrations. So, don't know if that's true or not, but it is important to realize that it is Martin Mass. So in addition to honoring and praying for those who died in World War One, we should remember the charity of St. Martin, who himself was an officer, who did all this charity while still a catechumen, who went on to become a bishop and do, to do so much for the faith that that um, before we enter into this next fast, we should thank God. Like you talked about the feasts and fasts, you know, throughout the year. One, one has fasts, so one can have feasts. If you don't have fasts, you can't have feasts. Yeah. And that now does it run right through Advent and takes you right to Christmas? Correct. 
And is it just Lent? Like, would you just do what you would normally do during Lent? Or is there any special? No, no, it definitely had a different character. I talk about in the book, the Lenten fast is the totally different. It is the most strict. When you were talking about Sundays being special days, that's true, except there is some caveats for Lent. Because in uh, the Lent's, uh, the Sundays of Lent are still days of absence, traditionally. People might be shocked. Nobody's taught about it. But really, until the end of the 1800s, really around the time of Pope Leo the Thirteenth, Sundays in Lent were mandatory days of absence. I've written articles on it showing historical evidence that's clear. You could not have meat during Lent on Sundays. And yeah, traditionally, I, I did, all of Lent was vegan. St. Yeah. Martin's Lent was not, vegetarian. But but the Lenten fast was vegan, and it even included I, Sundays. I had a lot of people get upset with me last Lent when I, when I said, look, I, if you give something up specifically for Lent, Sunday is not a day to go back to get doing that thing. It just means you don't have to fast on Sunday. But if you gave right. something up for Lent, you shouldn't go yeah. back and have that thing on Sunday. Your penance you're not is still actually, penance. Correct, yes. right? So it's Lent, and Lent is so like a marathon, me. and Sundays are like an aid station, a day without fasting. Doesn't mean the race is over, it doesn't mean you're not, you're still going. You know, Sunday yeah. is still a day. Actually, Sunday, I mean, you're not fasting during Sundays of Lent. Sun, uh, fasting on Sundays would not be appropriate. Um, but it's certainly a day of increased prayer. You know, it's certainly a day you could do penance. You know, so if some some people might say that even it's inappropriate to pray the stations and the cross on Sundays during Lent, and that's simply false. So, I mean, there's nothing wrong with meditating and doing penance and praying about certain uh, aspect of our Lord's life. Um, that's, so um, so Aaron's asking, abs yeah, so a, a day of abstinence, Aaron, would be a day where you forego meat. Is there anything else we give up or is it just meat? Well, except for Lent. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about Lent in a second. Absence refers to no flesh meat. So the meat right. of a mammal or a bird. Uh, it, it permits, and this, well, I mean, the early church, it was a little different, uh, but after 600, it permitted fish. So fish became okay. Around the 11th century, shellfish became permitted. Um, but generally speaking, when we say abstinence for hundreds of years, we mean no flesh meat of mammals or fowl. So meat. Uh, but that's why fish is, uh, is allowed. Alligators allow because it's a cold-blooded animal, you know, so things like that that might surprise people. Amphibian, snake, that would be allowed. That would not be meat in this context. Um, yeah. But during Lent, traditionally Lent was vegan. So no fish during Lent, no eggs during Lent, no cheese during Lent. That's why you have Easter eggs. That's why you have all these customs that are associated with it, with, with dairy and all. People would have to throw them away and get rid of them. Um, like like uh, pancakes on Fat Tuesday. Exactly. To get rid of your, your milk and your eggs and all of that. Exactly. And same thing yeah. with um, potchkes in the Polish. Wait, let's, let's talk about that for a second because people don't understand what. Okay, so Fat Tuesday, Mardi Gras. Is I tried to explain this to my kids. They didn't. They had no idea. I'm like, I, like the idea of Mardi Gras is you're you're not going out to party and get drunk and have a party. You're using up the things that you won't eat during. You know what Mardi Lent. Gras means, right? Mardi Gras. I talk about it in my book. The actual word Mardi Gras is derived from the literal words "farewell to meat." Uh, that's no, what carnival I didn't means. Know that. So Mardi Gras carnival, carnival, carnivale, meat yeah, is going okay. away. So that's really, you know, what it relates to. So when we talk about, oh, I'm going out to the carnival on, on Mardi Gras, you're saying goodbye to meat. So it's all mm -hmm. about using that up. So you're totally right. It's not just a, a day of debauchery, which is actually abhorrent, which is yeah. why there is uh, certainly in, in New Orleans, that is the day that we celebrate the votive feast of our Lord Jesus Christ to form in his passion that is set on that day. That's also where we have the 40-hour devotion. Uh, that was instituted to make reparation to God for the sins of Mardi Gras. It started because of sins against Mardi Gras. But I think that those who are actually observing an authentic Lent, a Lent of without dairy, without meat, fasting, prayer, and penance, um, Mardi Gras can be, can be celebrated. And it should be in the context of, let's go out, let's have that final steak dinner, let's have eggs for breakfast, you know, have that you know, glass of milk or that latte, because you're not going to have any of these soon. And yeah. then being thankful to God for these. Uh, but then we're getting rid of them. That's what Mardi Gras should be, not a debaucherous show. Now, one one big question I've heard argued back and forth among trads especially is, does coffee break a fast? 
if it's black, black coffee, cream and sugar. Coffee would not traditionally break the fast. And I, and as talked about in the book too, because that would be liquid. Liquids are permitted. And what do theologians say? What does it mean to be liquid? Doesn't mean you just drink it because by that logic, you know, you could puree up your steak and drink it and you say it's a liquid. No, it's not. It's obviously not a liquid. What does it mean to be a liquid? It means one must drink it and not chew it, but it also means it has to aid in digestion. And three, it has to have virtually no nutritional value. So they didn't okay. use the word calories back then because they didn't know about calories. But black coffee, you know, virtually no calories, aids in digestion. You drink it. Unquestionably, black coffee is allowed. And that's actually been said by the Holy See multiple times. It was allowed. Um, Everybody's so relieved. <laughs> Whereas opposed to some juices that are made from heavy puree would literally violate the fast even now. Mm. Because some people also think, oh, I'll have a smoothie. You know, you know, yeah. I go to Jamba Juice, have smoothie. That smoothie might have 600 calories. That is more than some <laughs> people eat at lunch. So, you know, you cannot have that. So this concern and care for what should I have? Can I, I should just forego these things is important. And it really shows a Catholic mindset, uh, a mindset that, you know, our forefathers had as well. So, all right. So I want to try and get uh, all the people that are in our Telegram and all the people that are part of our locals community, I want to get everyone that that actually does watch our, you know our channel regularly to do St. Martin's Lent. Oh, so how does it how does it differ from regular Lent? What should we be preparing ourselves for? Yes, yeah, so I'm glad you say that. So I also run a Telegram group too for those who in the Fellowship of St. Nicholas that I run with One Peter Five. So if anybody yeah. wants to also join that Telegram for information, we talk about fast throughout the year. It's onepeter5.com backslash fast. And I mean, you can go down to the bottom. There's a link to the Telegram group. We Probably have about 350 or so people in there who are doing these fasts throughout the year. And we have different tiers. So you can kind of ease into it. And St. Martin's Lent, I think, is tier two and thus tier three as well. Um, so what does it consist of? It consists of every day but Sunday. And we will exempt uh, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, too, as a holy day of obligation. Um, as a day of, of fasting. So one meal, one meal only, and um, that meal is, is vegetarian. Now, Sundays um, are, you know, exempt. Uh, and remember, this is not binding under a penalty of sin, too. So we're looking to what did people used to do. Um, some people choose to have meat on Sundays during St. Martin's Lent. Some don't. I would say that's up to someone's preference. But the other days, no meat, one meal in the evening. Some people I know as well are choosing to give up alcohol. That might be a worthwhile sacrifice too, even though it's never been part of uh, the Lent traditionally. The other exception too I'll mention is Thanksgiving Day here in America. Um, we do try to keep that as a fasting day, uh, since most people fast until dinner anyway, but allowing themselves meat at that particular meal on Thanksgiving. So that's kind of how we structured our uh, you know, St. Um, Martin's Lent. Yeah, so um, we're going to have a lot of people that are, this is probably going to be their first time doing it, and they and they were saying how daunting they find fasting. So we'll, what yep. we'll try to do is we'll make tiers. Yeah, and, and this is gonna... my calendar too. This is this is tier three. This is the ideal, what I try to get people to uh, aspire to. I have made a 2024 calendar that I'm going to post on the A Catholic Life website probably in a couple of weeks or early October since we still have some time. Uh, I do also make available calendar files if people want to incorporate this thing like an Outlook or, a, you know, um, a Google Calendar, an Apple Calendar or something like that, too. But I oh, even just awesome. saved this. And, you know, it kind of helps me understand a little bit more, too, about why certain days are here, what was required or, or not. And, um, you know, you don't want to get a little bit too hung up into it. You do want to live by the spirit as well, too, so especially these that don't mind under sin. Um and, I mean, things to keep in mind, too, is during St. Martin's Lent, we're going to have the Vigil of the Immaculate Conception, uh, which in 1957, Pope Pius XII instituted as a required day of fasting. Even though he had already abolished the Vigil of the Immaculate Conception a few years prior, he then subsequently made that a fasting day. Actually, it's kind of confusing why he did so, but but he did so. So we note that. We also know there's Ember Days during Advent, too. So those are going to be in red in December. You'll notice those. Christmas Eve itself also always going to so, be a day. So wait, now, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception is a fasting day? No, the Vigil. Oh, the Vigil, vigil. is, because the Feast, vigil. I would think, is oh. a feast day, right? Right, yeah. Uh, so um, some, a few things to know about, yes, the Vigil, so the day before, St. Ambrose's Feast Day, which is the Vigil of the Immaculate Conception, is a fasting day and a day of abstinence. 
um, the Immaculate Conception would uh, not be a fasting day um, in regards to St. Martin's Lent. So one thing that is worthy to know is some years, you know, people talk about this, when it falls on a Friday, is it a day of absence or not? And per the 1917 Code of Canon Law, it ceased uh, to be a day of mandatory absence on a Friday because it's a holy day of obligation. And it matters if it's a holy day of obligation in your area. So if you're in a country that does not observe that as a holy day of obligation, you would still observe absence. But the thing I like to make people aware of is that was actually quite a modern novelty. St. Pius X, when he did so, uh, actually broke tradition and went back more than a millennium. Because beforehand, if it was a Friday, it was always a day of absence, with the only exception being Christmas, which back to the time of St. Francis. So beforehand, if Immaculate Conception fell on a Friday, you would have to ask the Pope for a dispensation. And I have found historical mm -hmm. records of people doing this, for instance, All Saints Day in the 1800s, granted an exception, um, you would have to ask for that. You Because people, the Friday absence is so sacred and so foundational to our life as Catholics. It's almost as important as Sunday mass to people for centuries. Like the thought of eating meat on Friday was abhorrent, you know. Actually, that's why in some countries it was a crime. It really was. So when the Protestants were revolting against the Catholics, uh, Zwigli would go out and have sausage eating competitions on Fridays in Lent. It is an utter blast. And it would actually, it would revolt a, the, yes. a good Catholic. Yeah. Why did we revolting. stop that? Like, like, I, I you know, that's the same as spitting in our Lord's face on his way to Calvary. You know, that's a, somebody oh, wow. in an opinion of authority in the church saying we don't do this out of love of our Lord who was crucified today. And other people saying, I don't care is really what that's saying. So Paul the sixth is the one who got rid of the Friday abstinence, right? Well, it depends what you mean by getting rid of it, because every day really in the per the 1983 even code of canon law, it says every Friday throughout the year is to be a day of of, of penance. So um, when he kind of. When you make people have options and you think, well, you can do something else, then people feel like you don't have to do anything. So that's really the problem. It's in the 1983 code. So I would say every Friday of the year is to be kept as a day of absence, really. And I'm glad to see some countries like England, for instance, have really uh, brought that back uh, and manda mandated it. And I actually think about it, and I'm actually going to try to see if a friend of mine can help me do this. It's actually interesting for all that you know, Francis does to talk about the environment. Like, I'm surprised he isn't saying we just shouldn't eat meat, you know, on any Friday of the year. And here's the carbon emission, we would say. If I anticipated that might be <laughs> one of the only silver linings coming out of him. And I haven't seen that yet, but I kind of thought I would see that coming. But I think that's maybe a little too traditional is to bring back mandatory Friday. Yeah, but out. maybe maybe somebody should mention that to him <laughs> because it would be it. But even our, our bishops, right? Like, you would think one of, you would think, a Bishop Strickland would come out and I mean, all these letters he's writing, let's, let's get him to write a letter on Friday. After. I mean, I just think it's so few. I remember um, when I, uh, when I mentioned it on Twitter about not eating meat on a Friday, a, a Catholic, like a, a faithful Catholic was like, why are you not eating meat today? It's not Lent. Like it, it the average Catholic does not even know we shouldn't be eating meat right, on Fridays. Right. And actually, I mean, a lot of a lot of Catholics raised, you know, in, in Catholic schools, even don't know everything. I had somebody once some years ago tell me Ember Days weren't a thing. And I'm like, well, why aren't they a thing? I mean, obviously, I know a lot about them. And uh, and she said, well, I went to Catholic school for 12 years. and Nobody mentioned them. If they were a thing, I would have heard about them. So the, that kind of hubris to think that I must have known everything to think the faith is so superficial. You could simply glean it. Like, do you go through, you know, all of um all of your schooling and now think, well, I had history class every year. I know all history. There is nothing else yeah, I can right? possibly know. I'm a master <laughs> in history. I'm a master in every subject in English. You know, you cannot possibly teach me a word because I've had it's, English. You know, it's St. Thomas English. writes his whole summa and, and says it's like straw. And yet someone yeah. will go to a Catholic school for 12 years and think they know everything. Yeah. I mean, there's we, so much even I do. So uh, the places I write for, I spend so much time trying to learn and thus share, you know, what I learned and so many interesting things, even something to mention for today. It's the Feast of the Exaltation of the Holy Cross. And I wrote an article for the Fatima Center. Um, I think it was a little bit earlier this year and actually used St. Thomas Aquinas. And the question was, if you see a relic of the true cross, what worship do we owe the relic? What worship do we would do we owe the cross? And the answer per St. Thomas was actually Latria. Latria we would yeah. literally worship the wood of the cross. 
Um, and some people are surprised by that. And I have some people too read it say that can't be right. I, I, how would, I never learned that. Maybe it should be, you know, it's the means of our salvation. Food. Yes. So that means you, our Lord himself, when he will appear at the end of the world, it is said that all these fragments of the true cross that spread the world will be reunited and he will have his cross back. Um, it's integrally tied to him, but also it, it's just covered in his blood. You know, his blood seeped through the entire cross. So when you see a relic of the true cross, it's really like, um, you know, being in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament in a sense, because, I mean, God himself literally stained that with his blood. That is why traditionally in the church's rubrics, if there's a relic of the true cross and the priest comes in, he actually is told he needs to genuflect that at the start of mass, an unusual relic. And there's actually a whole... Um, series of mass said in the presence of the relic of the true cross and how it's a little bit different. Something that I found in an Irish ecclesiastical review published about 150 years ago. Again, something like that obscure. I like that stuff because it's important to make people aware of things now that have gone out of print and people aren't taught anymore. That I find a lot of that occurred with fasting when this was weeded away, even, even to Americans. You know, Saturdays were days of mandatory absence for American Catholics until um the early 1800s i think it was around the 1830s mandatory all year round on saturday because that was the day christ was dead in the tomb but you know that went out the window and now nobody remembers that whatsoever because that generation is long since gone we started off reading an article by schneider talking uh, of quoting saint basil who said the children should be compassionated the most because they do not even know what they have lost that's really mm -hmm. where we're at right now. Like, we don't even know what we have lost. Matt, would, uh, do, do you write full-time? Is that your gig? You're a full-time writer? or? Um, well, that's one of my jobs. So um, professionally, I'm a CPA. So I, so I am an accountant as well. Uh, I take on clients. Uh, and uh, But then I also oversee catechismclass.com. So people who want good, sound, traditional catechesis, whether adults or children, um, I spend a lot of time with catechismclass.com and help people convert, help people study for their sacraments, uh, help people, you know, take classes because they feel like I'm missing something here. I need to learn a bit more about the faith, yeah. really want to delve into it. So, I mean, I do all three things. So I, we chose fashion to talk to you about because that's the, the talk you gave in, in, uh, at the conference, but I'm going to actually, I want to talk to you off, off air and see if there's some other things that maybe you could teach us of the of traditions we've lost things like that so because i i feel like there's so many things that that have just been forgotten and it's there just, are i'm, I'm going to be working maybe one day god willing on another book too on uh so i spend a lot of time in fasting now but i'm a big into feast and fast so as you talked mm -hmm. about so i mean the fast is lost but the feast is lost as well and what i mean by that is we used to have 36 holy days of obligation as of the list published in 1642 and if you go back um, to the 1200s, it was 45 days, in addition to one's, one's patron. So the patron saint of your diocese, of your nation, of your parish, those were holy days of obligation for you, too. So you lose all that, too. And you lose so many days of devotion. So there's so much else that has been lost, too. So you lose right, these we, fasting days, you lose these feasting days, too. We have a few questions that, that I want to make sure we get to. Rob, go ahead. So what about beavers and capybaras? I know, you know for that's instance, a very good question. I literally was researching that today. And actually, because I'm working on the second issue of my book, I have a whole section devoted to beavers, capybara, and muskrat and puffin. puffin. Oh, the bird puff. Okay. But, yeah, puffin's actually one of the earliest ones. It was right around the 1698, a monastery in, uh, uh, it was a Benedictine in northern France. Uh, the priest there said people in the monastery could start eating puffin on, on Fridays. And actually, it was such controversy. The archbishop intervened, and he he published a letter, you know, condemning the practice. And then he actually decided to do a thorough investigation. He had medical examiners from the College of the Archdiocese go out and study the birds and visit the priest. And he ultimately determined, and this will kind of answer the question for all these animals, is he said, well, these animals spend almost all their times in the water. So they're virtually aquatic. So by our authority, will allow them. And the same thing can be said for beavers, too. So um, this actually goes back to Quebec. You know, uh, the Archbishop of Quebec, Quebec sent a letter to Paris and asked beavers, you know, these animals, I'm describing them, they spend all their time, you know, in the water, you know, can we eat them? And basically it came back, yes, you know, we'll consider them aquatic. Um, and that actually, though, was practiced in Europe to some extent as well. 
Uh, but actually in Europe for, for several centuries, it was agreed that only the tail could be eaten because the tail was the element mostly in water. And actually St. Albert the Great in one letter said to eat the whole beaver would be an abomination on a day of absence, but to eat the tail would be permissible. And capybara as well, uh, a large rodent also uh, degrees. They spend almost all their time in, in water. So for those pr particular people, those could, could be eaten too. So the thing to know it is a lot of different areas got different exceptions to absence or fasting. So nowadays we think, oh, uh, does everybody in the world have the same, you know, fasting and absence? We have hardly anything left. So it seems they do. But there were so many different regional differences. Even, even throughout the century, I'll talk about this in the book, if you were a Native American, you had different days than I did uh, because you were granted exceptions due to your physically demanding lifestyle. And if you were in the Philippines and you, one of your parents was a Native and one was a Spaniard, you had different days too. So there was a whole difference, even diocese by diocese. If I was in, a, in an English colony in America and you were in a Spanish colony and you, and you were in a French one and now we're in New America, each of our dioceses, we have different days of holy days of obligations and different days of fasting. And yeah. that really wasn't unified in America until 1885. So some of these exceptions started in certain particular areas and thus kind of went there. And Spain has its whole history, too. So that's really what it comes down to. So maybe not everybody could necessarily have eaten beaver, but an exception was at least granted definitively to Quebec. Same thing with South America for, for Capybara. It wasn't like they were then shipping capybara to Europe and saying, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we found a loophole, guys. We're going to send yeah. you something. <laughs> uh, Shelly says, this may be a silly question, but can those of us who are still Protestant join your fast? Of course. I mean, there's nothing preventing anybody from joining the fast. So, I mean, I think it would be yeah. quite meritorious for everybody to, to practice it. And of course, um, the fasting which we practice, which our Lord himself instituted really because he was you know the example par excellence he went in the desert and fasted for 40 days and 40 nights and ate nothing uh it is believed and of course he's god so he could sustain himself but he obviously felt human hunger in a really remarkable way but so many of the saints very early on in the church long before the protestant you know reformation i mean fasting was practiced extremely uh particularly so Everybody is called to to imitate what the early Christians do. And that's what I'm trying to give more people do to not just the minimum, but what did our forefathers do in love and and how do you how do you practice that? And if even if you look at the rule of St. Benedict, St. Benedict obviously lived long before the Protestants as well. And one of the um, you know, parts of his rule is he said the monks should love fasting, not yeah. tolerate it, not get by, not do good, you know, no good, but to love it. And you really think about that. And, um, you know, St. Albert DeVoe, he wrote a great book on, uh, uh, on the fasting, you know, to love fasting. And he said to love fasting, one must experience it. And to, to experience it, you, you have to, to love it. So it's really, you know, the ability of experiencing it and loving it. And you might think it's hard. Why would I love fasting? But as somebody now who has done fasting for, for several years, uh, at, at least, and tried to do more and try to get people more into it, is I genuinely look forward to the next fast because it's an actual means I have of making restitution, of clearing my mind, of saving time, of restoring my body, of being part of a community united in the same cause. It's so much. So anybody uh, who's listening, no matter who you are, you certainly can join this and should join this for that unity and that clarity and to be really, truly united. To, to Shelly and Aaron, <clears throat> like, it's funny because I don't think you guys realize you guys are looking in on Catholic content. And I don't think you guys realize how little Catholics know about their own traditions. So you guys are actually sitting in as we're learning about our own traditions that were stolen from us. And it's not just it started with uh, the with the Protestant revolt, of course, but. Over time, just modernism has crept into every facet of Christian life, and it has robbed us of our traditions and our birthright and all these things that if you go back through the Christian story and you look back into Christian history, these were things that were just so intuitive to Catholics over the centuries. It's why the church was able to de like defeat paganism in every place they went. And because we stopped all these traditions, especially of fasting, I think that's why you're seeing a rise of these ancient gods coming back again. Mm -hmm. uh, what else we got? Once again, does fasting begin on the calendar day or the liturgical day? Which would be at like Vespers, right? 
in in the Roman church is always going to be the calendar day. So some in the East would start certain fasts as Vespers and such, but the the fast that's uh, stipulated in canon law, even back in the 1970 Code of Canon Law, is, is going to be the, the calendar day we're referring to. And Aaron, I think somebody else asked a question about, yeah, why are they called Ember Days? I think I've seen that yep. said a few times, but I wanted to answer that. So that's actually kind of interesting. It brings up an interesting story. So uh, Ember Days is, is an English term, but if, if you're referring to it in Latin, Ember Days are actually quanta tempora, or literally translated as four times, okay? So uh, obviously they occur for uh, three different days, but four times throughout the year. And somewhere throughout the centuries, the Latin word tempora became uh, ember in colloquial speech, and those ember days is why they enter into, um, uh, into English. But what's interesting is even the cultural significance of ember days that I'm talking about in my book and my writings too is, for instance, you might know the dish uh, shrimp tempura, you know, a very popular yeah. dish maybe in Japan. Um, it's Portuguese, That was right? instituted because of Ember Days, because they're eating these food on the quantum tempura. You know, let's let's fry up, uh, you know, these these fish that, that we can eat have this day. That's why they call them tempura. So we, we use that now to determine all these different fried dishes and such. It doesn't mean fried at all. Tempura is, is from Latin time. It's called the, that's the food you eat in those different times. And there was actually so many even dishes that the Portuguese and, and Spanish would, would make as well that really gained in popularity in Japan. And this was long before, uh, uh, you know, the Japanese uh, really outlawed Christianity. And, you know, you were forced out or you were executed. And that was in the late 1500s. We have St. Paul Miki and others crucified there. Christianity, you know, outlawed. It wasn't until the 1870s that Christianity would became legally uh, allowed to return to Japan. And the Christians who came back and the missionaries who found the Christians who had still persevered in the faith all these centuries, who kept it alive, um, were still keeping these fast days and still keeping these absence days and still referred to these as tempura dishes from these different seasons throughout the year. So Ember Days has a long history. As I mentioned very early on when we started talking, they go back at least to Pope Callistus in the 200s. And while the date of them somewhat changed a little bit over time, sometimes they would be announced, you know, the Lever mentions that too. You know, we know by Pope St. Gregory the Great in 601, that's when he died. They were observed in four different seasons throughout the year. But we know for sure in 1078, the Roman Synod of that year established them under Gregory the Seventh that they would occur at the dates they occur now. So the dates that we know as the Ember Days are definitely the dates that go back at least to 1078. But the Ember Days themselves likely, as St. Leo mentions, go back to the very beginning of Christianity with the apostles. Yeah, the uh, um, we need another Pope Gregory. The Gregories were such great popes. <laughs> um, there was, oh, I wanted to ask Aaron. I guess I could ask him off air. I wanted to know if his Protestant tradition had Lent because there are some Protestant traditions that do have Lent, but I'm not sure what tradition he comes from. Um, Matthew, this was awesome, man. This was such a such a informative episode. I want to I want to maybe figure out something else to do with you too, and maybe do, do Thank you. something. Well, more. I'm glad to glad to meet you, see you guys again, and, and chat. We, I mean, I saw you walk by a couple times at the conference. Always good to chat with you. That was such a busy conference, but so good. Oh, so man. Many people, such a but. that was that was such a good conference, man. I had such a good time talking to everybody and meeting everybody. I hope that and there were so many great Hi. people. And, and everything but i mean literally every i did not have probably two or three minutes to myself where somebody else wanted to talk especially after you give a talk and yeah. you know, i'm happy to talk to people um but I'm, i mean it was good but if great to be on great to share some insights that i've learned and hopefully continue and people if you learn something share it so this knowledge doesn't die away again but yeah. you know if, if you are interested you know my book the definitive guide to catholic fasting and absence this is the first edition here second edition will be published next year but i even have priests well not known traditional priests say 95 percent of this book was new to them that they did wow. not, not taught in seminaries and, and rob make sure we post his website again um and if we can yep. the link to his telegram if anybody wants to join that telegram um rob you want to read the two reviews before we get off i'll i'll try if as long as the mic doesn't get moved too much <laughs> Iggy's okay party. let me let me sh Iggy loves to crash the party <laughs> rob rob's uh rob's kids love it all right so let's see uh where's the newest the best part of this podcast is the un unsubscribe <laughs> button. Don't waste your time on these low lives. Five stars. 
<laughs> That's amazing. Okay. Uh, everyone, everyone, everyone should avoid AB. At first, I thought this was a joke podcast, but I'm starting to think these dudes actually think the church still has... Oh, come on. Rob has said he went to Mass multiple times, and Anthony mentioned going to confession. I'm confused. These apostates need to repent and make a perfect act of contrition if they want to remain part of the remnant underground, invisible American church. But actually, I love the show. I will pray for you all five stars. So, Matt, what we do is we tell people to write a, a, a horrible review, but leave five stars for the algorithm. <laughs> yep. So... <laughs> Those are the two latest. Those are the two latest reviews, guys. If you leave a review on Apple Podcasts, we will read it on the show. We hope you make fun of us. We hope you make it funny, and the goal is to get us to laugh. Matthew, I'm so glad you came on with us, man. This is very awesome. Thank you. Uh, we'll we will uh, we'll post links to your uh, latest book. We'll post links to your website. We'll we'll hook everybody up in the comments. So if you caught this show on a replay, we'll put everything up in the comments. Uh, is there anything else we're missing, Matt? Nope. Just, uh, you know, as I say, like uh, you can learn a lot about fasting, but if you don't practice it, it's really worthless. So like the same thing with the faith, you can learn it a lot, but if you don't actually put it in practice, you know, it just draws. So yeah. hopefully you learn something today, but go out and practice it. No meat any Friday ever. Sunday mass every Sunday. Try even no meat on some Saturdays and you'll see what it does to you to experience that every single week. You actually feel like you are living, you know, a liturgical life more. That's the thing, right? So Mrs. Homemaker said she's allergic to fish. I would say try to do falafel. That's a great substitute. That's true. And remember, fish was added as an exception really under the time of Gregory the Great. I mean, yeah. try to be vegan is really what the early church was. So, so you don't have living, to have fish. A, living a liturgical life is such an awesome thing to do as a Catholic. And 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 if you learn to, to pattern your life on the liturgical calendar, it actually will because then it's not just mass on Sundays. You're actually learning to to move to the rhythms that the church over 2,000 years has shown, proven to be a way to make saints. I mean, that's exactly. really what it is. So, yeah, if you guys can, let's um, – I mean, if you guys don't already – abstain from meat on fridays that's the minimum come on everybody should be abstaining from meat on fridays i don't care for the exceptions they made in recent times let's all get doing this because we are going to have to stand before our lord one day and we will be held to account for the things we were unwilling to give up so yeah. and i would say try to add another days too add on saturdays wednesdays and offer it up for people like bishop strickland and our priests you know make yeah. it different you say the grace you can offer it up try to I'm, do that next week i'm offering up my cigarettes to aaron's conversion and shelly's conversion <laughs> and my father's man my father i need my father to come back to mass there's so many people in my life i'm gonna start fasting for all these people matthew thank you so much man rob take us out brother iggy don't touch stop it ah! <laughs> welcome sorry to okay here we go <laughs> Yeah, dude, we've been trying to do like... Aunt, Aunt, I think we're still live. Oh, okay. My monitor's off. Iggy, turn my monitor off. I cannot, yeah, I cannot see it. I'll end the stream.